Hello students, this is Professor Sansom, and I'm going to talk today about a lab that we'll do in Chem 107 that's an introduction to reaction rates. This lab has two parts, one is a simulation and one is the wet lab that you'll do in class. Uh, I do try and find a little spiritual thought for you each week that uh, shares something valuable spiritually and also has always a little bit of chemistry flair. So I did find this one from Marion G. Romney, who said, Desiring, searching, and pondering over the words of eternal life, all three of them together, as important as they are, would be inadequate without prayer. Prayer is the catalyst with which we open the door to the Savior. Behold, he says, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. And um, I think this is true spiritually, uh, that prayer helps really open that communication with the Lord. And also uh, today we'll be working with a catalyst in lab. So we'll see what happens when we add a catalyst is that the reaction occurs more quickly. So prayer can help us strengthen our relationship with the Lord more quickly. So today our learning objectives are to use collision theory to explain how reactions happen, explain why factors like temperature, concentration, and catalysts affect the reaction rates, and we'll justify those explanations using collision theory. In lab, you'll measure the initial rate of reaction for the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide, and you'll also improve teamwork skills. So that's our process skill for today. Teamwork has four different parts. One is interactions, so engaging in continuous interactions or communication among all group members. This just means that there aren't times when you're sitting silently staring at a blank screen or uh, not talking with your lab partner. Contributions, uh, I think, is really important. It means to consider the strengths and skills of all group members and involve everyone uh, in a way that maximizes their strengths and, and helps them contribute meaningfully to the group. Progress is making steady progress towards the goal, staying on task the whole time, and cohesiveness is uniting and functioning as a group. And the reason we have this skill here at the beginning of the semester is because we hope that you and your lab partner or partners will develop this ability to work together as a group in an effective way as you go throughout the semester. So this gives you an opportunity to think about how you've been doing so far and how you might be able to improve. Collision theory. So collision theory is an explanatory principle. It helps us explain why we observe the things that we do with regard to reaction rates. And for a reaction to happen, molecules have to collide with enough energy and in the correct orientation in space. So those three requirements have to be met in order for the reaction to be productive and produce products. And we have this reaction coordinate diagram where we have reactants on the left, products on the right, and then in the middle there's this hill we sometimes call the activation barrier, and at the top we have something called an activated complex or transition state. It's important to note that this x-axis here is not time. It's a representation of the progress of the reaction. So molecules could start over here and get halfway up the hill, they don't have enough energy, they fall back down. They could get all the way to the top of the hill, they have enough energy, but maybe they're not in the right orientation, and so they fall back down the hill again. Um, or they could have enough energy and be in the right orientation and collide and turn into products. It's also possible for the product molecules to collide with each other and react in the reverse direction. So you'll see this diagram repeatedly throughout Chem 106 when you're talking about rates, when you're talking about equilibrium. So there's a few things that will affect the reaction rates. One of them is the nature of the reactants. And um, if we look at this reaction down at the bottom, this is an SN2 reaction, which you'll learn about in organic chemistry. Um, but orientation is really important for this reaction. This nucleophile has to attack sort of in between these three uh, legs of our tetrahedral carbon. And, uh, in, and then the leaving group can leave from the other side and all of these three things flip around the other way. So the orientation really matters a lot. And this is one where the nature of X, Y, and Z matters. If X, Y, and Z happen to be really large, then it's harder for the nucleophile to attack this carbon. And so this reaction would be really slow. So one thing that affects reaction rates is nature of reactants. 
And we're not necessarily going to talk more about that, but it's important for you to realize that just the molecules that are actually reacting make a difference in the reaction rate. But then there's some things that we can control without changing the molecules, things like the concentration. When we increase the concentration of reactants, they're going to collide more frequently. Notice I'm using collision theory to explain why. They collide more frequently, and that's why our reaction rate will increase. If we raise the temperature, then a greater fraction of molecules have enough energy to overcome the activation barrier. And because they're moving more quickly at a higher temperature, they have more kinetic energy, they will also collide more frequently. A catalyst is a substance that will cause the reaction to proceed more quickly. And the way the catalyst works is by orienting the molecules correctly, and that lowers the activation energy. In biology, we have enzymes that act as biological catalysts, and that's the enzyme that you'll use in this experiment. It's called catalase, and it's found in many living things. There's, uh, it's in cows and humans and potatoes and yeast, and its purpose is to break down peroxides because they can damage your systems. And like all enzymes, this is going to lower the activation energy of the reaction by orienting the molecules correctly in space. And because these are made up of protein molecules, they have a specific three-dimensional structure that can be affected by temperature, pH, and solvation. So um, what solvent they're in. Usually it's water in a biological system. Why does that happen? Well, if the temperature changes, you might break some of the intermolecular forces that help maintain these alpha helix and beta sheet shapes within the molecule. If you change the pH, some of the residues that have charges, um, positive or negative charges, might get protonated or deprotonated and then not have a charge anymore or suddenly have a charge that they didn't used to have. That can affect the overall three-dimensional shape of the enzyme itself. If the three-dimensional structure of this enzyme is disrupted, it no longer can function for its purpose because it won't be able to orient molecules correctly. So they'll no longer fit into the active site of the enzyme. Catalase, it turns out, is very effective at catalyzing this reaction to decompose hydrogen peroxide to form water and oxygen gas. And if we look at the reaction, we've got hydrogen peroxide on the left, water and oxygen gas on the right, what's gonna happen? Well, oxygen gas will create bubbles. If we create enough of it, then it will actually increase the pressure that we observe in the experiment. Now, this is where students who are doing the at-home version of the experiment, it'll differ a little bit from students who are doing the in-person lab. In the at-home version, you use the oxygen bubbles, they lift up a piece of paper in your test tube, and so you'll be able to measure the amount of oxygen that's formed or how quickly it's formed by how fast that paper moves up in your test tube. And in class, because you'll have a pressure sensor, you'll be able to look at the change in pressure over time. Uh, I want to show you this demo of what this looks like. It's called elephant's toothpaste, and it involves hydrogen peroxide, which uh, constantly breaks down into water and oxygen, but I'm going to add a catalyst, potassium iodide, which will make the reaction go faster. Um, in the cylinder, there's hydrogen peroxide and a couple drops of dish soap, which will allow us to see the reaction occur. Um, this is potassium iodide. <laughs> As you can see, uh, the reaction is catalyzed and all the oxygen um, was released, and the dish soap you know, makes the foam with the oxygen and that's why you can see it shoot up. Okay, so that's an example of the same reaction that you'll be doing in lab. We're going to use uh, hydrogen peroxide that's less concentrated, so what you see will be less exciting. We also aren't adding the soap, and so there won't be as much foam or bubbles formed, but you will be able to see the oxygen that's produced in the experiment. If you're in the in-person sections, you'll be gathering data that looks something like this, where you've got pressure on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And you should see that the pressure increases. If the pressure isn't increasing in your system, there's probably a mistake 
or a leak somewhere. And so you should make sure that you check all of the points where things are connected to make sure there isn't a leak anywhere. And your TA should be able to help you with that. We're interested in the initial rate, which is just gonna be sort of this first part where it looks more linear. So you're gonna take maybe the first five or 10 points and use the linear fit function, which is down here on your control tools in the SparkView software. Whatever you decide to use for the first few points, um, try to be consistent in all of your trials about what you do because the graphs will start to curve over. And so you just wanna make sure that you're making a fair comparison between all the trials that you have. The slope of this line will be the rate of the reaction in kilopascals per second. So you'll actually be able to measure the rate at different temperatures. And this is useful because it can give us information about the activation energy. And in this reaction, you're catalyzing the reaction, which means you're lowering the activation energy. And we don't know exactly how much you're lowering the activation energy. So you're gonna find that out by taking this uh, measurement at different temperatures and you'll pull your data with a class, you'll be able to combine that all together and then you can get the slope of this line when you plot the natural log of the rate constant versus one over T, the slope is negative EA over R, the activation energy over R. We'll use the units of joules for this one. Okay, let's do a practice problem using this equation. Notice this equation is set up so that you have two pairs of points, a temperature and a rate constant one, and a temperature and a rate constant two. So you're gonna be plugging these in to find out what is the activation energy. So pause the video right here and go ahead and practice this on your own. We know uh, if we rearrange that equation, we can solve for EA. Sometimes people like to plug everything in and then do the algebra. I always prefer to rearrange everything. And uh, if we plug everything in here, we've got our rate constants, we've got our temperatures. Just make sure that you're uh, matching those up, the pairs correctly, uh, so that you don't make a mistake. And when we solve this, we should get 95,900 joules per mole or 95.9 .9 kilojoules per mole as our activation energy in this instance. So you'll be asked to do this on your lab report. In lab today, you should wear long pants and closed toed shoes and a lab coat and goggles and a mask. We won't ask you to wear gloves this time because of the glove shortage that we're having nationally. The solutions that you're working with are just irritants, so if they get on your skin, you can wash them off and nothing bad will happen. So that's the end of the pre-lab lecture for experiment three. Thanks for listening and good luck in lab.